Here we go, here we go again Trying hard but you wanna be my friend Ain't no place to hide, ain't no one to run to Here we go, here we go again Call my bluff, I'ma be here till the end I'm the one you ride, I'm the one you ride to If you Alrighty, what is up, four people in here? Um, my name is Ryan. This is the Kingsman Report. It's the news everyone ignores. And tonight, uh, the main article is uh, the Space Force is watching. So we're gonna go over that. I'm going to cover some stuff on the coronavirus, some tech news. More uh, obviously, whenever I cover tech news, it's how the government or corporations are using technology against you to gather information. So I'm gonna cover that stuff. And uh, as always, I have Paul here with me. Say what's up, Paul. What's up, people? <laughs> I'm with Paul, and he will screen your phone calls. If you want to call in, I would wait until uh, closer to the end of um, the show here, and then you can call in. If you call in now, you're just going to be put in a waiting room for, you know, uh, with elevator music for and however long it takes us to get through the news here. So, like la, I said, la, la, la. <laughs> and, and Paul will screen those phone calls, so he's the first person. So, we've had people try to call in here and troll, and if you try to call in here and troll, he will catch you first. Um, and we are only streaming on DLive. These will be uploaded to YouTube and then podcast form whenever we're finished here. So, with all that being said, first article I'm going to... I'm going to uh, cover is 61% of, the, of people want the U.S. government to make information on UFOs public. It's from the Daily Caller. 
came out this afternoon. It says a majority of people want U.S. government information on UFOs to be made public. According to a study from Pipsley, 61% of the people want the government to release any information it might have on UFOs and aliens to the public. Uh, the same study found that 58% of the people think government investigates UFOs and aliens, and 27% of people believe the sightings are real. There's a nice little picture here. Uh, I'm all in on this. I'm all in. Release the files from Area 51 and elsewhere, folks. Let the information flow through the streets and into the minds of the people. Ever since the Navy UFO video of the Tic Tac became public, it seems like People are becoming more and more interested in UFOs. So I'm not going to play the video. Uh, we'll have to upload it to YouTube and we'll get a copyright strike because they love us over there. But we covered this on here. We covered an article on here. Uh, it was actually a U.S. patent, wasn't it, Paul? Um, it came out that the U.S. government filed for the patent for the Tic Tac uh, UFO. So it came out that it was, that's in fact, government. I guess technology. Yeah. That's pretty much what I read too on uh, not on this particular article, but on another one. There was a whole full article about that particular gist you just mentioned. Yeah. So take in consideration if if and we showed the patents on here. We talked about it. Uh, we talk about black budget uh, operations they have all the time where they have secret technology. We talked about. I've done a video on Tonopah. Uh, I've I've gone into excess on a lot of this stuff, and they're all all of those videos are on my YouTube, and the link to that is in the about section on the D Live channel, so you can go check those out. It's also in podcast form. So the article goes on to say, "Do I think aliens and UFOs are real? Not a clue. I don't know anything more than you guys do. Of course, a UFO a UFO doesn't naturally mean it's an alien. It just means it's a flying object that can't be identified. Now it's it." Is it a lot more fun to assume it's an alien spacecraft? Sure, but that's not what this uh, what it means by default. Either way, I say live on the edge and declassify everything, embrace the chaos. If the aliens are here and we need to get some X Files kind of stuff, then so be it. Uh, but if you ask me, I've mentioned it before that I believe I've told you what I believe. Uh, aliens are interdimensional beings i believe we own the technology i think we've been there kind of uh been there done that when it comes to this type of stuff other people may have different perspective and that's absolutely fine um what's up smack they played this so nonchalantly on the news um so this article says uh, paul talks a lot about crystals and uh different attributes of crystals uh, how we're discovering we can use those uh for all types of things, how they harness power, energy, um, vibrations, whatever you want to call it. Uh, this article came out uh, yesterday. It says scientists are encrypting information using crystals. It says think of a random number, now think of a second one. You already failed because the numbers you chose weren't really random, mathematically speaking. Compared to a truly random sequence generator, research has shown that humans are less likely to pick the same number twice in a row and more likely to create patterns in the sequences they choose. But don't feel too bad for yourself. Your computer can generate truly random numbers either. This has been pr uh, this has proven to been, be an issue for a lot of machines which are controlled by automated pseudo-random uh, number generators and susceptible to hacking. Random number generation is vital in mathematical modeling and crypt cryptography uh, where it is used to encrypt information. Uh, locked websites and secure web traffic. Even so, truly random numbers are hard to come by. Scientists and code makers rely on natural phenomena like radioactive decay and atmospheric noise to drive randomness. Now chemists have, for the first time, harnessed another natural source of randomness, uh, chemistry. These scientists built a robotic system that uses the process of crystallization to create random string of numbers and encrypt information, and they published a study with their finding on Monday in the Journal of Matter. We took the world crystal and we encoded using our random number generator and we also used a well-known algorithm, said Lee Cronin, the senior author of the study, the chemistry professor at the University of Glasgow. Uh, we found our messages encoded with the genuinely random numbers took longer to crack than the algorithm because our system could guess the algorithm and then just brute force. 
Here's how it works. Under the right conditions, chemicals in a liquid solution can go from a uh, disordered state to an extremely organized one, and otherwise known as a crystal. The process is filled with randomness from uh, the time it takes for the crystal to form to the geometry, uh, geometry of, that it produces of the product. So here's a pictures of it. So Cronin and his uh, co-authors co designed a simple robot that views an array of crystallization chambers with a webcam and converts some of the features and sees into a string of ones and zeros. The researchers looked at three different chemical reactions and compared their encoded strings for, quote, crystal uh, to one created with the Maristine Twister, a general-purpose pseudo-random number generator. Once their decryptor figured out the way in which the algorithm generated numbers, the crystallization method took longer to crack. The method offered uh, an as good alternative to existing true random number generators, and according to Cronin, his system may even have some advantages, including the potential for indefinite use. Paul, do you have anything you want to say about this one? Mm. I just find it interesting, like how much stuff they're dealing with crystals nowadays. I mean, and it seems like everything we turn around is turned back to the crystals. Like, the, they found that that state of water and the crystals, you know, we were talking about iodine as crystal, we're talking about, you know, your pituitary gland, and then you've got the new computer chips made of crystals. You know, that's what, that's what silicone is in the base of it. It's just, this is so amazing to me that, yeah, that we're here and that yeah, yeah everything is you know lights a prism you know that's shown off of a crystal basically it's back to the fundamentals awesome. of existence rock yeah. crystal light water uh <laughs> basically just the basics the foundation of of everything and remember the article we covered paul that had to do with that tiny little crystal they found in the o on ngawi trust on a dime i think it was yeah, that was amazing too, huh? That thing was it's, it's old. Like, that crystal was old. The, the dime wasn't old, but the crystal was definitely old. All this stuff is coming back to crystals. It's really wild. It is insane. I forget how old that crystal was that was in that article. It was very, very, very old uh, crystal. They found just chilling in an O on a, in God We Trust. It just happened to be in the center of the O on a dime. Um, and it proved, they found in Australia. Yeah, and it proved that uh, that our existence has been around forever. Like it came from somewhere in outer space and it somehow embedded itself in the O on God on a dime. It's very. I'm willing to bet that boron is a crystal too, because it says it's been placed here from space. So I'm willing to bet that's a crystal. And if you go into the space zots or zats, they the the whole mission that they don't show behind the scenes is that the reason they were on Apollo was a sun mission. That's why they went to the moon to check out the sun. And that they found all these little um, pieces of glass that were in teardrop form. And they're, they're like a crystal of glass shot out from the sun. And they have we have them on Earth too, but, but the scientists will say, oh, these are from volcanoes. But you, you can tell the difference between the round bits and the you know, jagged edge ones that come out of a volcano than these ones that were shot at high speed through space because they've got a teardrop tail on them. It's like, well, okay. And they have certain um, radioactive frequencies on that particular molecule that only the sun can do. <laughs> so it's pretty interesting. And we're just now discovering this is what's insane. And the information that we'll get from all this stuff that they're discovering will increase knowledge exponentially probably here in the future. Um, so you guys, I, sorry, Paul, it ahead. seems to, it just seems to tie all together. Like, like all the stuff they're talking about in this article seems to tie back into the two computer chips that they were using and through, um, you know, that mystery connection that they had and they moved them from, you know, across the room and they put information on one chip and it went into the other chip without any supposed, uh, radio transmissions. So then they moved it what was it, like 10 miles or 15 miles down the road, and then they moved it like 156 miles down the road, and they got a 90% switchover. And this this seems to be tying into that really well. And it's like, well, 
I think there's a few people out there that know a lot more about all this than they're letting on, and we're only we're only scratching the surface right now. Oh yeah, and, and I like I said, I think uh, knowledge will increase. Now, will they share this knowledge with us? That's another question. Usually, things they uh, they they find or they discover, they tend to keep it secret from us, and it'll come out, uh, you know, a decade later, and uh, pretty much anything that they say they have in the desert. Uh, or anything you've seen in the movies, any anything, Ben Rich, I believe, is the one that said that. Anything you've seen in the movies, anything that you can imagine, we've been there, done that, and it's parked in the desert. So, just imagine. The stuff you're probably seeing in the sky, the UFOs, is probably um, our technology or other foreign uh, government technology, and they've had it for a very, very, very long time. And they're probably way further advanced than that. So, these discoveries of these crystals and, and layman people that are actually finding these, you know, scientists at colleges, schools everywhere are finding this stuff and they're actually getting the chance to study it and they're publishing papers on it, which is good for us. So that that's kind of opening a window to the things that other people are starting to discover in the world and all over the world. It, it's just strange to me that in that in particular crystal, it was found in the center of the O on God on a dime, American currency in Australia. I just think is very awkward. Someone placed that there. They it's obvious to. that that was done on purpose. It's just too, it's too bizarre to not been done on purpose. Yeah. So we'll go on to this next article here. And uh, you guys, uh, if you ever watch us, you know how I, I love to talk about uh, the infringement on your Fourth Amendment, the illegal search and seizure, the constant surveillance um, by corporations for governments via the ring doorbells. Uh, uh, what is the other one? Uh, Reckon or whatever it was that wants to put uh, license plate scanners in the in, in doorbells or home security cameras. So they can scan people's driver's license or their, not their driver's license, their uh, license plate numbers as they drive up and down the street. So all of this stuff is coming out. We've covered the robots that they want to place in... Uh, Traveling hubs, restaurants, movie theaters, and they constantly just, they're just scanning all all this information. We covered the suitcase cameras. We covered Clearview, the app that the police departments use, where they use multiple different social medias and they gather pictures from uh, innocent people all over the place. And then they can pretty much use an app and just scan crowds, and it picks up a facial recognition, and then they run you through a database. So I I tend to point this stuff out all the time if an article comes out and it might get redundant but I'm going to continue to point it out because it's just further and further and further into this and the more we continue to buy this stuff we're just playing into the hand of the people that want to constantly keep eyes on it. so I'm going to read this article and this one says Amazon ring cameras will spy on your neighbors but in a nice way it's a nice way everyone so just keep that in mind so Amazon smart security cameras have a new way for you to make and maintain friends in your area by sharing video moments of neighbors doing nice things, nice and neighborly things. Ring smart devices already allows access to neighbors app, a portal for sharing video clips, suspicious activity, or general concerns over security in the area. It's not quite Facebook, but certainly has a feel of social media about it, about it and how it connects locals with each other over a common cause, their own safety. While users could already post positive things they've seen in the area, it seems like Amazon-owned Ring has taken things a step further with a new neighborly uh, moment function for shining light on good deeds in the area. So, uh, did your neighbor take out the trash for you, wash your car after mistaking it for their own, tackle an escaping burglar to the ground? Uh, that's ripe neighborly moment material. Users can already apply various tags to videos, verifying are varying from local pets to possible crimes, but the upbeat nature of this new feature may be in response to concerns over the use of hostile language and overzealous surveillance on the platform. Well, absolutely. So Amazon Ring has had a hard time of <laughs> had a hard time of it this the past year with various concerns over how user data and private video feeds are being handled internally by its staff. Because if you don't recall that, people that actually worked for Ring in Amazon said that they've watched uh, people's videos who are actually customers. Uh, just randomly watched people's videos. They've been hacked numerous amounts of times. Um, you know, they've harassed children in their own bedrooms. Uh, 
uh, the kids that were playing basketball outside of their house in their driveway. It's just everywhere. So now they want they want to add a feature though. They want to add a feature to where you, if your neighbor's doing something for you, I guess you could send the video and share it to everyone. Look at my neighbor. He's such a great person. The cops are like, yeah, he's so great. He's got warrants out for his arrest. Get him. So it says, even if you don't share those worries, there's no doubting that there are real power to, uh, to surveillance in any community and being able to use cameras as a way to reinforce positive encouragement seems like it could be a good development. At very least, it may give paranoid homeowners some reprieve. I, I don't. I, when it comes to this type of stuff, I constantly just think it's it's selling you like, hey, this is a convenience for you, or uh, you know, show off your nice neighbors, or protect your home, or have all these smart devices in your house. But corporations continue just to use it for crap against you. At the end of the day, when you say, Paul, you said you were going to sign up and get a ring doorbell, right? I was gonna order ten just for all my neighbors, so I can spy on them. <laughs> Deck your whole the, house the out. Funny thing, <laughs> the funny thing is, is this: this when I pull up this techradar.com um, article, article, it has um, 5G nationwide all over it. It's so trying to sell T-Mobile, and then you go down the bottom, and it's like, oh yeah, well, we recommend the video of getting a Fitbit too, so we can spy on you all the time. And then the 5G will just, you know, watch your, be like the eye in the sky watching you. And then it's Marvel movies. They're are the most popular. It's like, oh, great. And then Oscars. And then iPods. It's like, uh, when, when does it end? It's not going to end. Not until they got it. Uh, one of those androids from iRobots living inside your home. Where they put a chip in everybody and you're walking around like upgrade and you've got superpowers to be a ninja. And you're all knowing. And as a matter of fact, that is actually supposed to be coming out here pretty soon. The um, Elon Musk, um, oh, what is it called? I've covered this too, and I can't think of it. But yeah, Elon Musk is his little thing where he puts the little droids on your brain. That one's supposed to be coming out pretty soon. So, hell, we might get there. I don't know. Uh, I'm going to cover this because it, uh, this is kind of close to where I'm at. I'm in Oklahoma. Uh, this happened on. In Louisiana, so an Exxon Mobil refinery blaze lights up the night sky. If you guys are keeping track of even these, uh, I think we've had one in Texas recently, so we've had this one. Uh, we've had them, I think, in uh, up east. We've had some of these um, on the east coast. It's pretty much just a lot of these have been going on lately. So a fire inside the Exxon Mobil refinery here turned the night sky a shade of orange and sent a large plume of smoke into the air. Flames erupted around 11.30 p.m. Tuesday, Baton Rouge Fire Department spokesman Kurt Monte said. Uh, ExxonMobil spokesperson Danny Lee said a company volunteer, uh, a volunteer fire team responded and there were no injuries and the fire was contained to the area where it occurred, Lee said. So I'm just going to point that out because it's just awkward to me that this continues to happen with the refineries uh, burning up. Sounds like a Black Mirror episode. Yeah. I know. It, it, truth is, uh, I guess, stranger than fiction. You know what I mean? All right, so I'm going to uh, cover the coronavirus. The video could get taken down on uh, YouTube after we upload it there later. I don't really care. I'm going to get the information out now. This goes in podcast form. So if the video is taken down on YouTube, you can listen to this. Just look for the same thumbnail. Look for this thumbnail, uh, the anchor link is down in the about section click on there and then you can go to all the different platforms it's offered if you listen to uh, apple Podcasts, click on there and you can go and listen to it there so if they take it down look for that thumbnail with that title uh, space force is watching you so uh, the next article here is nearly 200 georgia residents being monitored for coronavirus 97 new deaths in china Evacuee from Wuhan, China tests positive for coronavirus, Jonathan Sear reports from Atlanta. Georgia health official announced on Tuesday that roughly 200 residents were self-monitoring for the coronavirus after recently returning from China. None of the residents have shown symptoms of the virus or visited Hubei province, the epicenter of the outbreak. Health officials reportedly didn't use the word quarantine, instead phrasing it that people are being isolated in their homes for 14 days, which is considered the virus's incubation period according to the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. Uh, so, uh, yesterday I read an article 
they're saying 14 to 28 days now. So it's changing. Uh, you can get it within 15 seconds. There's so much crap going on about this. Some people are just going at this in excess. Um, we've, we, we've covered all pretty much all of it, too. I'm just not keeping up with this is how many people's died. This is how many people's recovered. I'm not really keeping up with that anymore. If things start to change like this, and we see an uptick of this happening in this country, I'll report on it. And I'll bring awareness to it, but I'm not going to just continue. i, I got to cover other things that are going on in here. So it goes on to say, a uh, new paper by a Chinese scientist says the period could last as long as 24 days, like I just said. Officials have reportedly been calling each traveler, uh, letting them know of the potential symptoms of the virus and the importance of staying at home during the time frame. Residents under quarantine were given an online tool that notifies them when their isolation time is up, according to the AJC. So... Uh, I'm going to uh, cover this article here, though. Uh, there are no reports of coronavirus infection in Georgia as of Wednesday, and commercial flights have been suspended between Atlanta and China. Local experts say Georgia's processes to handle emerging diseases are better than ever, the paper reported, and there are 13 confirmed cases of the coronavirus in six states throughout the U.S. Oklahoma, we're testing for one here. We quarantined one coming from ORU, or uh, as a student at ORU. Uh, it turned out they didn't have it. Uh, but I think we're testing one more here in our state. So about 393 people in 24 countries around the globe have been infected with the virus since it was first reported back in December, and 99% of those cases still remain in China. And China reported 97 more deaths on Wednesday, increasing the total to 1,113 in mainland China as the country remains closed off from the rest of the world, and some 60 million people remain under virtual quarantine. The new infection case declined for the second straight day, with 2015 reported in the last 24 hours. And the United States Postal Service said on Tuesday that it was experiencing significant difficulties on sending letters and express mail to China after airlines suspended flights to the country. They said they can no longer accept items to China, quote, to until sufficient transport capacity becomes available. So I'm not going to cover any more in this article. I will, when I'm done here, I will upload these into the Discord. You guys can snag them from there. Um, when this is uploaded to the YouTube and the podcast, all these articles will be in the descriptions of those as well. Um, so this is the map as of recent. Um, so you can see the total deaths, 1,118, 45,210 total confirmed. And we're still sitting at about... 13 in the U.S. I've covered this map. I sent it out to everyone I know that was covering this also. So I'm going to cover a few more articles on this. Some of these articles came out yesterday. Uh, I mentioned the titles to the articles, but I didn't really uh, uh, cover a whole lot of it. So uh, this article says, Coronavirus outbreak, very grave threat for the rest of the world. And this is, let's quote from the World Health Organization. So the World Health Organization says it is sending a team to China to investigate the coronavirus outbreak as the case numbers continue to rise. Jonathan Sear reports from Atlanta. A day after the team of the World Health Organization medical experts arrived in China to investigate the deadly coronavirus outbreak, the health agency's director said the virus poses, quote, a very grave threat for the rest of the world. With 99% of the cases remain very much an emergency for that country, but one that holds a very grave threat for the rest of the world. Who Director General Tedros Adhanom, uh, this guy's name is incredible, said during a video conference with hundreds of researchers on Tuesday. In an appeal to researchers who had dialed into the conference from all over the world, Tedros called for more collaboration in order to fast-track rapid diagnosis testing and vaccines. And it's hard to believe that just two months ago this virus, which has come to captivate the attention of the media, financial markets, and political leaders was completely unknown to us, Tedros said, adding that there is still many unknowns about the virus, including paths of transmission and exactly how it originated. To defeat this outbreak, we need answers to all those questions and more, he said. Um, like I said, if you want to read more of this, I'll post the links in the Discord. The link to the Discord uh, is down in the About section. So this is an interesting article, and Paul and I talked about this. Uh, at the beginning of all this, uh, we showed we showed the list before it got way out of hand. Uh, we showed the list of everyone that was reported deaths 
Uh, it had their names, their ages, and er pretty much every single one of those pe people. At the time, I think the youngest person was, what, 46 to 48, weren't they, Paul? Yeah, they they're not. They were saying that there's not a lot of children that have this, and we were discussing it, how the children have um, less toxins and whatever is built up in their body, so it seems to be affecting specific groups of people that are more... Um, have had more exposure yeah yeah um and i think anyone that's that's contracted this it may have gotten worse since we kind of laid off of it and uh let you know the bigger channel started running with it so we just kind of backed off from it so we could cover other stuff aside from this because other things were happening um you don't have to pay late-term hospital care if, if you get rid of the 40 to 50 years old for a certain section of group so your your prices go down in 10 years for your medical care too yeah so it, it was it's strange but pretty much any of those people had uh, uh they already had conditions they had you know uh, what you know uh whatever you want to call it they've they had a whole bunch of pre-existing conditions whatever you could think of they had those types of things and so they would they would contract this disease and then they would inevitably die because they've had all sorts of uh, stuff before they got the virus. Um, but this article we, we thought was interesting because uh, it says, why are children missing from coronavirus outbreak? And this is one thing that I've noticed too, covering this a lot for two weeks straight, eight day, eight hours a day for two weeks straight. We cover this. Um, I noticed there wasn't any, hardly any talk about children getting this whatsoever. The article says the outbreak of the new coronavirus in China has killed more than 900 people, but one group that it has escaped minimal damage is children. You can certainly contract the virus. Among the infected are at least two newborns, according to a Chinese health official. But according to an article published February the 5th in the Journal of the American Medical Association. According to the data analyzed in the article and numbers uh, are changing quickly as the outbreak evolves, the median age of patients skew older between 49 and 56 years old, which is awkward too, but they already had you know pre-existing conditions also. If you look at this list, the majority of them had pre-existing conditions. It's not entirely clear why children seem to be escaping the worst effects of a virus, the 2019 NCOV, which you know is not the name anymore. Um, COVID-19 or COVID-19, whatever you want to call it. Um, it says, but a similar pattern holds for many infectious diseases from the familiar, such as chickenpox and measles, to the newly emerged, including several acute respiratory syndrome, SARS, and a Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, MERS, doctors say. We don't fully understand the phenomenon, and it may be because of differences in the immune responses of children compared to adults. Dr. Andrew Pavia, the chief of divisions of pediatric infectious diseases at the University of Utah, told Live Science in an email. One hypothesis is that the innate immune response, that is the early response to the aim, uh, is, that is aimed broadly at groups of pathogens, tends to be more active in children, he said. So the innate immune system is the first line of defense uh, against pathogens. Cells in the system respond immediately to foreign invaders. The adaptive immune systems, by contrast, learns to recognize specific pathogens but takes longer to join the battle. If the innate immune response is stronger in children exposed to the 2019 NCOV, they may fight off infection more readily than adults suffering only mild symptoms. Other coronaviruses, including SARS and MERS, also show this pattern, said Chris John, uh, Johnson, an epidemiologist at the Temple University College of Public Health. If you want to read more, I'll put the link in the Discord, but we found it interesting that, um, because you think being a younger age, so when you when you live a long life or, or whatever, you tend to grow immunity to a bunch of these uh, different things, and we thought kids would probably be the most vulnerable of all groups, but surprisingly, unless they're not reporting it, now keep that in mind also, unless they're not reporting this, kids seem to be the less vulnerable when it comes to this. So, in this country, we're telling everybody, don't freak out about it. Uh, you know, 
it, just practice good hygiene. We we're telling everyone to use um, wet wipes. Wipe everything down. Wash your hands repeatedly. Just take precautions, and you should be okay. Um, so if you can do those things, you'll be all right. Uh, so this is strange. This is a little bit of tech news. It's a little bit of uh, coronavirus. Uh, China has launched an app so people can check their risk of catching the coronavirus. This is probably how they're honing in all those people that they're throwing in the back of box vans before they rustle them off to wherever they're taking them. So it says China has launched a new, quote, close contact detector app that lets people check their levels of risk for catching the coronavirus. It tells users if they've been near someone who has been confirmed or suspected of having the virus, and the app was developed by government departments and the state-owned China Electronics Technology Group using data collected by health and transport authorities, according to the state-run news agency, Zen Hao. You see where this is going. Uh, the coronavirus has now spread from Wuhan in central China to almost every province in the country and around the world. It's infected over 40,000 people and killed over 1,000 people, virtually all of them in China. So how it works. So you get this. Users sign up to the app by scanning a QR code on their smartphone through popular apps like WeChat, Alipay, or QQ. They register using their phone number and then enter their name and ID number. They can check the status of up to three other people by entering their ID numbers. If they are found to have been close to, uh, in close contact with someone who has had the coronavirus, they are advised uh, to stay at home and contact local health authorities. So... Even even if they didn't, when you buy a phone in China, and I covered this, uh, when you buy a phone in China now, when you go to register that phone with whatever service they have over there, you are required to take a face scan as part of your identification to say, hey, I own this phone. Uh, so they have pretty much all your biometric data is embedded in that phone. Uh, but as you can see, yeah, it, it's ran by a government agency to develop the app, and then you're supposed to contact local health authorities. Now, if you've seen any videos we've seen, and you've seen the local health authorities running around with long guns all over the place in China, I don't know what the world they were doing doing that type of stuff, but... Are they scanning, scanning your retina through those apps to see if you're sick, too? Um, I don't know. I think it's just... I, I, well, I don't know how you would uh, bust it. Yeah, I posted that on my socials. Uh, Jesse Smollett is what I call him, has uh, been indicted. But here's the thing about that, um, Kim I, he was only uh, he was only indicted on disorderly conduct. I mean, that's not that's like that's nothing. He'll probably get a little bit of jail time, but for the amount of crime that he yep. committed, it's not really anything. Disorderly conduct, it's, like it's six six counts of it, which means he could do five years per count, which is. 30 years. He, he could. He could. But uh, Chicago, it's kind of like New York. They People go in and they just rotate and go right back out on the street. You know what I mean? Unless they, someone wants to set an example. You know what I mean? Unless somebody wants to set an example. So it says um, close contact covers a, riot, a wide range of people, including those who live together, work together, or share, uh, share a classroom, as well as medical staff, family members, or other caregivers. Passengers on a plane are considered in close contact if they are seated within three rows of someone who has contracted the virus, or contracted the virus, according to the BBC. Powered by mass surveillance, such an app would not be possible without the Chinese government's persuasive high-tech surveillance of its citizens. A national video camera network, facial recognition software, and artificial intelligence combined to ensure an anonymity is almost impossible. Although it is not clear which elements are being used to power the app, so it doesn't specify necessar necessarily, Paul. <clears throat> it says, in any case, it's unlikely to be controversial in China, where attitudes to privacy and freedom differ from the West. <laughs> well, yeah. I guess every day you got to wake up there and just, you know, who's ever... Xi Jinping or whoever, you've got to pretty much get into an app and make sure your social credit score is up to par or out to the edge of the uh, town for you. Uh, the next article here says coronavirus researchers are using high-tech methods to predict where the virus might go next. Uh, this is from Time. It says, 
as the deadly 2019 NCOV coronavirus spreads, raising fears of worldwide pandemic. Researchers and startups are using artificial intelligence and other technologies to predict where the virus might appear next and even potentially sound the alarm before other new potentially threatening viruses become public health crisis. So what we're doing currently with the coronavirus is really trying to get an understanding of what's happening on the ground through as many sources as we can get our hands on, said John Brownstein, chief innovation officer at Boston's Children's Hospital and professor at Harvard Medical School. After SARS killed 70, 774 people around the world in the mid-2000s, his team built a tool called Health Map, which scrapes information about new outbreaks from online news reports, chat rooms, and more. Health Map then organizes... Uh, that previously desperate data generating visual visualizations that show how and where communic communicable diseases like the coronavirus are spreading. Health maps, output supplements, more traditional data gathering techniques used by organizations like the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the World Health Organization. The project's data is being used by clinics, researchers, and governments. Uh, as of early February, Health Maps 2019 NCOV data vis visualization shows China covered with red dots. Yellow means fewer and, uh, than 10 cases have been reported in a particular location. Uh, so it'll go into all this, but uh, we use a different, it's kind of different than, than this one here. Similar but different. If you guys want to read more about that, uh, link will be in the... Thank you for the uh, lemons. Thank you for the ice cream, and thank you for the other ice cream, Alan. I appreciate it. If I'm not paying attention. I'm trying not to look up constantly. I'm trying to read the chat over here. So <laughs> this is this is what uh, it's called. You can call it COVID, COVID, COVID nineteen, whatever you want to call it. Uh, coronavirus, if you want to. Uh, you know, whatever you want to call it. Things killing people left and right. Uh, so this article says, vaccine for new coronavirus, COVID-19, could be ready in 18 months. We covered something similar to this about three weeks ago when I was really covering the um, coronavirus outbreak. We covered this, and they were talking about uh, how they wanted to expedite the process in order to um, get a vaccination ready. As a matter of fact, a few days ago, I think, that I um, covered an article about this. They want to do a bunch of stuff. They want to try the, you know, go through the trials uh, with the vaccinations. They want to expedite all the process so that they can get a vaccination out. I, for one, will not take one. Um, you're going to have to, like, knock me out and give me one. I'm not going to say, oh, yeah, if this prevents it like the flu, give me one. Sign me up. I'm not, I'm not doing that. So, it says, the first vaccine targeting China's coronavirus could be available in 18 months. So we have to do everything today using available weapons, World Health Organization Chief Tedros said in Geneva on Tuesday. I'm just going to say Tedros because the guy's name, look, I don't know how you pronounce this, and I haven't put it into anything to try to pronounce it, but that is a monster of a name. And I, for one, if you've ever tuned in here, I, I butcher names worse than anybody out there. So he said the virus had been named COVID or COVID-19, you can call it CVID, uh, whatever you want to, um, explaining that it was important to avoid stigma and other names that could be inaccurate reporting, uh, inaccurate. So we'll see. I don't, um, I don't know. But like I said, I'm not getting, I'm not getting one. That was weird. So, after reading all that, then I'm going to throw this out. This is from Reuters. It says, exclusive coronavirus outbreak may be over in China by April. Almost makes you wonder, is this controlled? Because just articles, ominous articles like this pop out in the news, and then you read it, and you're like, what? How? I mean, and this is from expert says. But we'll see what the expert says. It says, uh, the coronavirus outbreak is hitting a peak in China this month and may be over by April. The government senior medical advisor said, on Tuesday in the latest assessment of an epidemic that has rattled the world. 
In an interview with Reuters, Zong Nesan, an 83-year-old epidemiologist who won fame for combating the SARS epidemic in 2003, shed tears about the doctors, Li Wayne Lang, who died last week after being reprimanded for raising the alarm. But Zong was optimistic the new outbreak would soon slow, with the number of new cases already declining in some places. The peak should come in the middle or late February, followed by a plateau of decrease, Zong said, basing the forecast on mathematical modeling, recent events, and government action. But this is what I'm saying. If government action, we don't even we don't even know what the government action is. I don't think that they're going to necessarily tell their own people what the government action is. And I'm not going to get into all the speculation about you know, burning stuff and whatever those heat maps are showing. I'm not going to get into all that. You can go to the socials where I posted all the crap on there. You can go to the Discord where I post all these articles. Uh, you can listen to the podcast where we talked about all this stuff. I'm not going to get into all that stuff, but I don't believe the information necessarily, personally. You can believe whatever you like. Do you believe the fire bombings? Fire bombings. Yeah, that's the information I was getting. Was that they they were literally that it wasn't smoke from dead bodies that people were burning apartment buildings and there was so many apartment buildings on fire because they were burning them out. I, I've I've heard something like that, but I mean it could be uh, they're driving around the trucks blowing smog or smoke or disinfecting well, whatever the that crap is. I don't. I mean it, it, that's it, not helping, is it? Well, no. Yeah, here's the coronavirus, but let's make this better. You stand on the side of the road, and people are literally in this one video running across the street, and they're with these huge cannons running down the street, blowing this big old plume of smoke out. And people are having to run out of the way of the plume. It could be, you know, those plumes going to the air. It could be um, all of those things. It could be firebomb. It could be burning corpses. It could be uh, the smog machines. It could be any of those things. You know what I mean? It could be any or all of them combined at this point. Yeah. I think they're I trying agree. to cover up themselves. You know what I mean? It's kind of like, oh shit, mom's come home. Let's hurry up and cover everything up before she comes in the house and discovers what we've done. You know? Hey, what did they spray back in like the fifties and sixties that they were spraying for mosquitoes? Was it? It wasn't DDT. It was something else, wasn't it? Uh, I don't know, but they had a spray truck come by your house and shit. I I I just heard stuff where he was reading about it, but yeah, here in Oklahoma, we still have that. They still drive up and down the street around a certain time of year. Mosquitoes get real bad, and then they'll drive up and spray that garbage. Every- yeah, they still do that here in Oklahoma. Oh, but, I mean, the mosquitoes God. around here look like a- they could fly by and pick a horse up. You know what I mean? They're pretty uh, They're pretty big. They're not like um, these tiny little baby mosquitoes. And I used to not get bit at all by them. For some reason, as I get older, they I'm bit all the time. I don't know what it is. But yeah, they still do it here. I don't know, I don't know what it is. I haven't acquired like what are you guys spraying out of that truck? None of that stuff. Probably not good, I'll tell you that. <laughs> but yeah, I remember whenever you're a kid or you're say you're at the park or in your front yard playing and that truck drives by, it's like makes a loud bzzz, with that you can hear that generator pump run spraying the crap out of the back of it. Bad. Yeah. Nasty. I'm sure it's not good for you either. Just like deed is wonderful for you, ladies and gentlemen. Use plenty of it. I'm being uh, <laughs> yeah, it's right up, right up there with sunscreen. Yeah. Uh, eat garlic will help you fight off mosquitoes. They won't find you tasty. Uh, it says, those comments may soothe some global anxiety over the coronavirus, which has killed more than 1,000 people. And has seen more than 4,000 cases. Almost all of China's on previous forecast of an earlier peak turned out premature. We don't know why this is contagious, so that's a big problem, added Zong, who helped identify laws in China's emergency response systems during the 2002-2003 SARS crisis. He said uh, there was a gradual reduction in new cases in the southern province of Guangdong, where he is based, and also in Xinjiang and elsewhere. So that's good news for us. With China taking unprecedented measures to seal in infected regions and limit transmission routes, Zong applauded the government for locking down Wuhan, the city uh, at the epicenter, which he said lost control of the virus at an early stage. The local government, local health care authority, should have some responsibility on this, he said, and their work had not been done well. The virus is believed to have originated in early December in Wuhan's seafood market where wildlife was illegally sold. 
you believe that, I have some oceanfront property in Arizona, and you can, it's for sale right now. Um, so you, like, you can believe whatever you want to whenever it comes to this. We put out all the information. Everyone's putting out all the information about this. You can believe whatever you want, um, whether it's mainstream, whether it's your friends saying this isn't a big deal or whatever. Dude, take air all the information with a grain of salt. Uh, read it for yourself, make up your own mind, and then apply whatever means necessary to... Uh, you know, to prepare for it. Wash your hands. So, we played this guy's video on here. He's dressed like, me and Paul like to say, he's dressed like, whether it's a monk, a ninja, something like that. But we played the video where he was going around, he was walking through uh, this hospital. And he was asking questions about um, the way they were treating the bodies, how many bodies were in there. He was just asking for... You know, he was asking honest questions and kind of kind of being denied. But anytime he would walk by somebody, Paul and I noticed they would walk next to him and they would bow as he would walk past. Uh, certain people would bow to him. Uh, so he is the citizen journalist covering the coronavirus that's gone missing in Wuhan. Um, so, like I said, we covered we covered this guy's video. It was it was pretty crazy. What we showed, we can't, obviously can't show it on here. Uh, YouTube, when I upload this to YouTube, they'll strike me. But I'll go ahead and read the article. I mean, I hope he's fine, but they're they're picking everybody up that's reporting on this over in Wuhan. So even small changes in China have global effects. A second Chinese citizen journalist who had been covering China's deadly coronavirus outbreak from its epicenter in Wuhan has gone missing just days after the disappearance of Chin uh, Kushi a former rights lawyer uh, who was a uh, who was video blogging from the city. Sorry. Fang Ben, a Wuhan businessman who had been posting videos filmed from city hospitals, was allegedly arrested on Sunday. According to Hong Kong broadcaster RTHK, the same day he posted a 12-second video of a piece of paper with the words, Resist all citizens, hand the power of the government back to the people, written on it. Which you read out loud, which wasn't good. Um, it, not good in their culture, politics, none of that. RTHK, which didn't aim its source, said that plainclothes police officers accompanied by firefighters broke down Feng's door to enter his flat. And Hu Yong, a Chinese artist and rights activist, told courts yesterday that Feng's friends had uh, separately told him of the arrest. In China, citizen journalists are rare because they can't obtain the official certificate required for reporting news as they don't work for a registered outlet. But amid increased public anger against the authorities, some have taken the risk of offering the outside world a first-hand glimpse of the situation in Wuhan. But as China's government struggles to contain a coronavirus outbreak that has killed at least 1,110 and infected close to 45,000 people, it has also stepped up efforts to contain the narrative around the epidemic and keep public anger censored on local authorities. In addition to dispatching journalists to uh, produce more, quote, positive coverage from the Wuhan, Beijing has censored the more critical coverage from Chinese media and is silencing specific voices. Now, Quinn Wang China researchers from the nonprofit Human Rights Watch noted that it appears that, quote, authorities are as equally, if not more, concerned with silencing criticism as with containing the spread of the coronavirus, repeating a pattern seen in the past public uh, emergencies as well. But the Chinese government needs to learn from experience and understand the freedom of information, transparency, and respect for human rights uh, facilitate disease control, not hinder it. So Chinese authorities are doing themselves a disservice by disappearing Fang and Chen he told courts via email. And now with the international attention on the two men, the disappearances certainly don't help with, uh, with the open, transparent, and responsible narrative the government wants to make the world believe. So I'll show you, I think it's in here. I'm not going to read the entirety, but if you've watched our channel, then you remember this fella here. Um, I can't play it, but yeah. He put out some, some very um, intense information to say the least this video some i mean it was it was kind of graphic it's another reason i'm not going to play it but uh hopefully he's all right they're not known for being um you know very gentle over there when they kidnap you and throw you in box rooms 
Still there, Paul? He may have been just... So the next article is Veer Bio identifies two antibodies that might stop coronavirus. I think this is like close to the last article I have on this. So Vire Biotechnology announced Wednesday morning that its researchers have identified two uh, monoclonal antibodies, or M MABs, or MABs, that uh, bind to the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein found on the surface of the coronavirus that the World Health Organization officially named COVID-19 this week. The disease first identified in Wuhan, China, has killed more, so we're going to continue to go over that. So. Uh, we are pleased that using the same platform uh, that used to isolate the MAB-114, which is proven as an active against Ebola, we have quickly identified antibodies with the potential biological activity against SARS-CoV-2, said sci uh, Chief Scientist, Scientific Officer Herbert Skip Virgin, and we are working as rapidly as possible to look forward to sharing more information about as we have it. So using antibodies instead of vaccines, Veer Veer, I guess is what it's called, it has a uh, library of 20 antibodies that bind and neutralize various coronaviruses that cause diseases like SARS. And these antibodies are found in people with the unusually successful immune responses to infectious diseases. Drug-based and MABs differ from vaccines and have attributes that make them particularly valuable in pandemic situations. Most, most vaccines and antibodies are uh, propo prophylactic i.e. they prevent people from getting infected, but antibiotics can also be therapeutic, helping treat those who have already been infected. So antibody treatment also works more rapidly while a vaccine tri triggers a response from the individual's own immune system, and it can take weeks for the response to build up a level that provides a good defense. By contrast, antibody treatments provide the immune response and can be effective in a matter of hours. We are in the process of assessing neutralization with a pseudovirus, said Veer CEO George Skangos. In addition, we are working with the international partners to assess the ca uh, capacity of these antibodies to neutralize the live virus SARS-CoV-2. So there's that. Um, I'm not going to go over this <clears throat> entirely. I posted this on my Twitter, so if you follow, if well, if I posted this on the Kingsman Report Twitter. So if you want to read this, I thought it was very interesting, but it's a Wuhan 400 coronavirus 1981 novel predicts the virus origin. So if you guys want to go check this article out, it's just it's just weird. It's like a bunch of bunch of stuff has predicted this video game. You have a book, you have uh, all types of stuff. So, if you guys want to check this out, I'll post it in the Discord after this. I'll post it, in, it's posted on the Twitter account. You guys can go check that out there. And uh, on to the next. So, as you can see on your screen, this looks hilarious. And I would not recommend anybody do this. Uh, this is from Zero Hedge. But India's leaders claim drinking cow urine will cure COVID-19. Uh, don't, don't go around drinking cow whiz. Please. Please, please, please do not do that. So Indians prime uh, So India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi and his extreme Hindu backers are making some amazing claims about science. You drink your cow urine is not uh, not not a, a breakthrough to me, but uh, it sounds gross. It says, Indian nationalists peddle something worse than snake oil. It's the cow dung cure for coronavirus. So this uh, fellow here, president of the Hindu, uh, this group here, a central organization that advocates uh, Hinduness, declared that a consuming cow urine and cow dung will stop the effect of infectious coronavirus. Swami added that, quote, a person who chants Om Nam Shiva and applies cow dung on his body will be safe. The Sanskrit chant is a solution to Shiva, a Hindu, a salutation to Shiva, a Hindu deity, uh, the goddess of war. 
The Swami and the prominent figure in a hardline Hindu circles and an ideological affinity with Mr. Modi. Uh, since the Hinduist uh, party or the BJP ascended to national power in 2014, its views have infiltrated textbooks and even scientific disclosure. Mr. Modi has suggested that ancient Indians had test to babies, citing the case of Karna, a hero of uh, this group here, a Hindu epic from the 3rd century BC. Mr. Modi told the gathering of doctors in 2014 that since Karna was not born from his mother's womb, this had to mean that genetic science was present at the time, referring to Ganesha, the elephant-headed god, he said. There have must have been some plastic surgeon at the time who got an elephant's head and put it on the body of a human being. So, um, if you guys want to, I mean, it's not really going to go, you can get the gist of it there. I read it at the top. But don't go find cow dung um, or cow urine and smear it all, all, all over your body. I, w I wouldn't recommend it for anybody. So if you didn't know this already, uh, I'm going back into some more tech news. It says, uh, it appears U.S. has a smoking gun confirming Huawei built spy backdoor. Well, of course they do. I mean, of course. According to the Wall Street Journal report, the U.S. government officials are claiming Huawei... Uh, a phone and telecommunications company with ties to the Chinese government has the ability to spy on users of mobile phone networks employing Huawei, uh, employing Huawei equipment. The claim comes from years of accusations of the U.S. government and repeated denials from Huawei. But, I mean, they're obviously doing it. While Huawei is one of the largest sellers of phones in the world, its original business was building telecommunication networks. However, the U.S. has been weary of allowing Huawei's equipment to be incorporated in the U.S. Te telecommunications network. The 2012 congressional report effectively banned Huawei from selling the equipment and strongly discouraged U.S. phone companies from selling Huawei's phones in their stores. U.S. wariness comes from the concerns regarding Huawei's ties to the Chinese government, its founders, former Chinese military, and good old-fashioned protectionism, 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 and the uh, company has been well positioned, provided equipment for a rollout of affordable and fast 5G networks. A Chinese tech giant, uh, Huawei, is embroidered, embroidered in numerous controversies, including allegations of corporate uh, espionage, I'm sure. So, there is no question in my mind that the extra scrutiny Huawei has been under as of late uh, to do with the political environment between China and the U.S., as well as the high stakes about the AI and the 5G, Lynette Ong, associate professor of the political science at the University of Toronto, told me via email last year. Ong specializes in Chinese politics and political economy. And last year, the U.S. and Huawei traded barbs over the U.S.'s concerns and Huawei's alleged spying, fraud, and violation of international sanctions against Iran. The furor led to uh, both Australia and New Zealand banning the use of Huawei equipment in telecommunication networks. However, some of the largest telecommunication networks in the world, including ones owned by the UK-based Vatafone and the German Dutch Telecom AG, currently incorporate Huawei equipment. U.S. officials now claim Huawei has included backdoors into the equipment that effectively allows it to access the same data law enforcement can access. Typically, these backdoors, known as, quote, lawful interception interfaces, are used exclusively by law enforcement who must provide warrants to gain access. The equivalent of the old school wiretap, these lawful interceptions, uh, interception interfaces gives the user the interface access to any data transmitted over the network, including phone calls and text messages. Naturally, equipment providers aren't supposed to have access and aren't supposed to build the equipment in such a way that they gain access uh, down the line. But the U.S. accuses Huawei of doing just that. According to the Wall Street Journal, the U.S. took its latest proof closed-door meetings of the officials and tel uh, telco companies in the UK and Germany. A confidential memo written by the German Foreign Office and acquired by the U.S., uh, sorry, by the Wall Street Journal characterizes the proof presented in the meeting as a smoking gun. All right, we're going to have to figure out something about that um, going down during the thing. 
Um, however, publicly, these companies and officials are a little more uh, reticent. Vatafone denied any equipment maker uh, could access its network in a manner, while Dutch Telecom AG told the Wall Street Journal a, uh, a German company had developed its lawful interception interface and thus Huawei couldn't access it. But it, but it isn't necessarily up to the corporations who want to continue to use well-designed and super cheap equipment built by Huawei. The German legislator is planning to vote on a bill in the coming weeks that could give Huawei the ability to provide equipment for Germany's new 5G networks. The bill has become a point of contention between Germany and China, with China threatening consequences if it should happen. The revelation of the U.S. still unseen, quote, smoking gun certainly has an interesting timing. I mean, it's kind of just what they do, though, you know, but... I wouldn't, uh, I mean, I don't put it past them. If, if Usually if somebody says somebody's fine, it's probably usually true. Uh, this article is, is important, but it kind of seems like a, um, I don't know. I'll read this to you guys, but uh, some other people have covered this. It says, the Philippines announces plans to back the U.S. military defense alliance after two decades. It says, Philippine spokesman denies White House claim that human rights was briefly discussed. Uh, Chief of the White House correspondent John Roberts reports from Manila. From Manila, the Philippines notified the United States on Tuesday it would end a major security pact allowing American forces to train in country, a, uh, a pivotal move under the President uh, Rodrigo Duterte, who threatened to pull out of the agreement after his key ally's U.S. visa was terminated. So this <laughs> this seems to be the issue here. His key allies, U.S. visa was terminated. So the Foreign Secretary, uh, Tedro Lacassin, announced on Twitter that he notified the U.S. Embassy in Manila that uh, in the Philippines is pulling out of the 1998 Visiting, for uh, visiting Forces Agreement. And the accord allows American forces, along with U.S. military ships and aircraft, to rotate through the Philippine military bases for roughly 300 joint exercises annually with Filipino troops. Deputy Chief of Mission of the Embassy of the United States has received the notice of termination of the Visiting Forces Agreement. Loskin tweeted, As a diplomatic courtesy, there will be no further factual, uh, factual announcements following this self-explanatory development. Is there anything you want to say about that one, Paul? I mean, this dude's pretty hardcore. Aside from that. Are you there? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I'm good. I, I think that whole article is interesting because it's, um, it's just, I think this is like one of the more important stories going on in the background. Then, um, I know the people have covered it, but this is, seems to be, um, quite important for that whole area. It's pivotal. The Philippines relationship is pivotal. I, mean, I thought I read somewhere that it was all because he got denied a visa application. Like he normally would have a visa on his passport, but then they didn't re redo his visa. Yeah, Seems it, strange. it's right here. It says um, Dierte, who threatened to pull out of the agreement after his key allies, not even his, but his key allies, U.S. visa was terminated. So. I, I, there's got to be something more to this than to, you think a guy would honestly do something like this over. You think he's that petty to do something over his buddy's visa being terminated? Oh, I think it must be. Um, I don't know. I don't know if they've wrote that wrong. His key ally, maybe you know, it could be misinterpreted as that he's a key ally. I'm not sure if they wrote it right. They've they've gone pretty shit on the writing these days. I'm yeah, bad too, but. But this guy's pretty hardcore regardless. Uh, Dirte's pretty pretty hardcore. He's the guy that's like, everyone have a gun. You can have a gun. Uh, you know, kill corrupt uh, officials and all that stuff. The guy is, is pretty hardcore when it comes to, like, I guess his people. Um, he's pretty pretty hardcore. But, I mean, I imagine he's pretty hardcore if you um, break the law, too. And if... And if it is someone else, it could have easily been, you know, speculation here that it, that someone else did something wrong, and that's why their visas, you know, they've been 
you know, trying to get rid of corruption. Someone else might be involved in corruption, so they're getting rid of someone's visa because they've done something wrong. Which could be a possibility. It could have heard something down the line, and that's why they are doing that. You're right. But we'll never know. I mean, it may come out later why, why it happened, you know. But until then, that's what's going on with the Philippines. Like Paul said, that is kind of like a, a place those militaries in the region practice at. I guess you would call it a practice scrimmage, whatever. Looks like no moss, according to him. This article I thought was interesting, too. The Air Force just killed one of its hypersonic weapons programs. Uh, so the Air Force has canceled the hypersonic conventional strike weapons program, one of the two major hypersonic weapons being spearheaded by the service. While the development is a blow to Lockheed Martin, which was developing HS HCSW, its other hypersonic weapons program, with the Air Force, the Air Launch Rapid Response Weapon will proceed... Uh, Air Force spokeswoman Ann Stefnik uh, confirmed on February the 10th. Because of, of buzz, budget pressures, the Air Force was forced to choose between funding HCSW and ARRW in 521 and opted to keep ARRW uh, due to being a more, quote, unique glide body design compared with the HCSW, which was similar to hypersonic weapons under development by other services, Stefnik said. And a, a and all these abbreviations, ARRW is on track for an early operational compatibility in FY22. We will continue to work collaboratively with our sister services to see how uh, we can most effectively leverage each other's capabilities, ensuring the most prudent use of taxpayer dollars, she said in an email statement. Lockheed was notified on Monday that its work on the HCSW will conclude after a critical design review this spring. The program's cancellation was not due to poor performance, Stefnik added. The HCSW team pioneered significant advancements in hypersonic technology development and integration of existing and mature technologies for use in various hypersonic efforts across the Department of Defense, <gasps> including Army, Navy, and Missile Defense Agency programs, he said. Jeez, that's a mouthful. The HCSW team successfully met all developmental milestones. These advancements will serve to expedite the generation of demonstration of various hypersonic weapon capabilities in the near future. In total, the Air Force hopes to invest $382 million on hypersonic prototyping in FY21 fiscal year, um, down from 576 in uh, 20. So. Looks like a uh, oh, what you call it there, um, Lockheed. Ah, I'm sure they make plenty of money. So, uh, thanks for the uh, donation, Alan. I appreciate it. If I'm not paying attention to it, man, I'll, I'll uh, shout them out here at the end. Um, so here's this article. The first uh, crewed SpaceX flight could happen around May the seventh. I'm I'm just curious how this is gonna go all together. You know, last month. Elon Musk said he expected SpaceX crew Dragon to launch with astronauts on board sometime between April and June. Now ARS Technica's Eric Berger reports that first crewed flight could take off on May 7th, though to, uh, due to, quote, a number of variables not hardware-related, the launch could happen in late April or later in May. We don't know yet uh, how long the flight will be. So there's the tweets there for it. Uh, and it's been almost a year since the Crew Dragon achieved one major milestone, reaching the ISS. In January, SpaceX completed Crew Dragon, Dragon's in-flight launch escape test, which proved that the capsule can break away from the Falcon 9 rocket and splash down the Atlantic if necessary during launch. SpaceX has also successfully completed a round of engine tests without any explosions. At this point, it seems things uh, are going well for SpaceX and Crew Dragon. And it makes sense that following the successful test and Musk's previous estimate, Crew Dragon might be ready for launch on May 7th. When the flight does occur, it, it <coughs> excuse me. When the flight does occur, it could look something uh, like this, simulated to many video clip. And you can watch it. Uh, if you click this link, I can't play it here. That Musk tweeted late last year. So I look forward to this. I mean, I'm kind of curious to see what kind of CGI they're going to use. I kid, I kid. 
So this is the last, and Paul read this article even before, uh, we're probably reading around the same time. He read this yesterday. I saw it yesterday and thought it was very interesting. Uh, and this is kind of what this is based on here. Space Force is watching you and a Russian satellite are stalking a U.S. spy sat in orbit. The Space Force is watching. So, um, if you want to call in, which seems like everyone pretty much dropped off. Uh, if anyone's listening and want to call in, the number scrolling across the bottom of the screen, one four zero eight six three eight zero nine six eight. 638 Enter the meeting ID, 534-233-4758. And Paul the Midnight Rider will screen your phone call, and you can come on. You can talk about any of these articles, uh, any articles you want me to pull up while you're on air, and then we can also talk about those. All right. Um, so this article says two Russian satellites are stalking a U.S. spy sat in orbit, and the Space Force is watching. A U.S. spy, spy satellite is being trailed by two Russian satellites, according to the commander of the U.S. Space Force. Yesterday, which was... February 10th, John J. Raymond, the Space Force Chief of Space Operations, revealed to Time Magazine that a pair of Russian satellites have come extremely close, within 100 miles of the U.S. spy satellite. You view this behavior as unusual and disturbing, Raymond told Time Magazine. It has the potential to create a dangerous situation in space. Raymond said the U.S. government has reached out to Moscow about the close range of the satellites, expressing concern through diplomatic channels. Uh, the Russian spacecraft launched in November uh, as one in November as one satellite, which later released a second satellite from within it, almost berthing it. U.S. military analyst said, according to the Russian news agency TASS, this maneuver was meant to test the technical condition of domestic satellites. In an interview with Business Insider, Raymond said the two satellites have been behaving uh, similarly. This similarly is one word for some reason so simple, but I have a hard time pronouncing it. To what are known as, quote, inspector satellites from Russia. Quote, in, other, in any other domain, such a move would be interpreted as potentially threatening behavior, he told Business Insider. Russian satellites were first spotted by Michael Thompson, a satellite and spacecraft enthusiast who tweeted about the observations. Something, so poten uh, something to potentially watch, Cosmos 2542, a Russian inspection satellite, has recently synchronized its orbit with USA-245, and NROKH-11, Thompson tweeted. Uh, this, is a, this is all circumstantial evidence, but there are a hell of a lot of circumstances that make, make it look like a known Russian inspection satellite is currently inspecting a known U.S. spy satellite, Thompson tweeted on January 30th. This is the first time the U.S. military has publicly revealed a direct threat from another country to a U.S. satellite. Identifying and rectifying such concerns was a huge reason behind the Space Force. As more and more satellites are launched with increased capabilities to gather information from space, more opportunities are created for interference from these satellites. Space Force, the new U.S. military branch, will receive $15.4 billion as part of the Trump administration's 2021 budget proposal and will be a, a quote, technology-focused service, according to Raymond, Space Force's first official leader. The branch aims to protect the interests of the U.S. in space, which will include mitigating aggressive acts and interference in American progress. Ongoing efforts by both Russia and China to advance their space programs has factored into the establishment of the Space Force, and now while the Space Force continues to investigate the two Russian satellites, political tensions between the two nations remain high over accusations of Russia interference in the U.S. electoral system. So, what do you think about that one, Paul? Do you, I mean, it could be nothing, could be something. Who knows, right? I think a lot of it's hype, but it's interesting hype. Do you think, honestly, if it was a if it was a viable threat, though, that they would tell the public, especially Time Magazine, hey, look here, uh, we have this threat of a possible, yeah. you know, satellites spying on another satellite in orbit. I think that they would probably try to handle it first before it came out. So I'm not necessarily taking it too time, serious. Time, time Magazine's been suspect for 15 years, probably more. But <laughs> like, I mean, yeah, but they've gone to CNN. Yeah, but but uh, also it being an amateur, you know, guy with a telescope out there checking out the stuff that spotted it and tweeted his own observations, I think it's pretty neat. Just, so there's that. I don't see, 
I don't see Russia and China as a threat. I mean, everyone keeps trying to tell me that they are. And I just like, I mean, I found this MIG once in a museum and like, it's so tinny and, and I've been around like F-15s and all that stuff. And I'm real close to them. And I you can tell I'm blowing in other, um, quite a few aircraft. And I'm like, well, you can tell which one, like, it just didn't seem real. It was like, it like, even though it was real, it seemed like it couldn't compete with what we've got. And I'm like, is this just like, uh, these are like paper dragons and paper bears. That's how I see it. And it's used in the media to make people believe that there's an enemy because there really isn't. And so yeah. then they fear. It's all about fear, making you afraid. And then, yeah, I, don't, I just don't buy it buy any of the t Russian or Chinese technology. Just, yeah. No, but I don't buy, I don't buy other education either. I mean, I, I grew up in the, in Iowa and we had the best education in the country at the time. We were ranked number one in the world, number one in the United States. And so I look at it like, um, I had to, like, was, went back to you about talking to you about driver's ed and I had like the best teacher in the whole state. So like basically I had the best teacher in the whole world for driver's ed. And so I look at it like, would I want that guy teaching me how to drive? Would I want that guy who would be similar to teach me how to fly? Yes. Would I want some guy in a third world country um, teaching me how to fly with his instruction? They just don't have the knowledge we do. And and they just, they don't, they're, they're how, how do I say it? Like, Without trying, I'm not trying to be racist. I'm just saying, truthfully, if I have to pick, I have to pick the guy, the farm boy from Iowa to fly me around the world, and trust him, than some Taiwanese pilot who's crashed, you know, whose country has crashed 15 planes in the last 10 years. It's pretty simple math. <laughs> yeah. So I I look at it like in a bigger picture, saying, well, do I think these people are something to worry about? Not really. If even if they steal our technology, they can't. They, they probably don't even have the wherewithal to use it or make it properly. Yeah, I mean, I'm pretty pretty much with you on that one. So I guess that's pretty much all we have for tonight. We don't have any callers. Um, uh, we're pretty much gonna go back to structured show. So people that have a month subscription, if they say we're never on here, this I mean, this is when we go on here. So we're going back to the structured show. This will be uploaded onto YouTube if you want to catch a replay. Um, if you want to like it, uh, you know, share it in particularly, uh, then you can go ahead and do that on uh, YouTube. So we'll upload it there, and then it'll be uploaded in the podcast, and then all those links are in the uh, uh, in the about section to all the socials, the YouTube channel, uh, the website, everything is there. You guys can go check those out and find us on there. So uh, I think that's pretty much all we have for tonight. Is there anything you want to add? Any more, Paul, before we head out of here? Oh, I'm just writing the same thing you said. Just please, share, you know, wherever people can share. It's just, otherwise, we're not going to continue. We just we have to have help sharing what we're doing. It's just can't, you know, it has to grow. If it doesn't grow, then I don't know what. We are growing. Just It's quite slow. And it seems like... Me it's actually grown faster on D Live than YouTube. I, I, th this channel on D Live has grown faster than YouTube, which is crazy. But whatever. I mean, but yeah, you know, tell people about the podcast, share the uh, YouTube videos, and we'll upload it over there. So uh, if you guys want to check out socials, if if you want to get the videos and the podcast all in the same place. Just go to the website. You can watch the videos there, and and uh, you can watch the or listen to the podcast directly from there. Um, all right, I thank you very much, uh, Sky. I appreciate it. So we're gonna go ahead and sign off. Uh, you guys have a great evening. Uh, we may keep it running uh, and just play a video and hang out with you guys. Thank you to everyone that donated. Top donors, uh, Alan. Which I like the new uh, picture, by the way, the uh, anonymous mask. That's pretty rad. Uh, Sky, thank you, and Paul Revere, thank you, guys, for donating. 
So, uh, you guys have a good evening. Uh, I may jump off here, find a video, and then uh, work from behind the scenes. So, until next time, or until I jump back on here, you guys have a good evening. Um, Y'all bless and shalom. Trying hard, but you wanna be my friend. Ain't no place to hide, ain't no one to run to. Here we go, here we go again. Call my bluff, I'ma be you till the end. I'm the one you ride, I'm the one you ride to. If you I can